Make my life a prayer to you. I want to do what you want me to. No empty words and no white lies. No token prayers, no compromise. Good morning. It's lovely to be with you again this morning. And I'm really excited about how many of you have signed up to become prayer warriors. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll have to go listen to last week's sermon. But it's exciting to think of our church as becoming a church with a war room of prayer. Where we can make a difference in the spiritual realm. Because we beseech the God who acts on the, in the, on the prayers of his, of his children. And so... If you're part of that group, please know that I'm praying for each of you daily, that you'll be able to stand strong and persevere in this race. But let us go to the Lord in prayer. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. Yes, Father, we come before you this morning as the life giver, as the one who shows us how we must walk. We are not wise. Whenever people choose their own path, they stumble and they fall. And you've given us the, your light, Lord. You've given us your path. You've given us your word to know how we need to live. And so, Lord, lighten us that fire for the desire to be obedient, fully, totally devoted, no compromise following in your footsteps. We pray for all of that in your wonderful name. Amen. This morning we carry on in our lessons from lockdown. We've done the first half of Philippians and now we, we're moving on to the, to the next half. And as we've said is that these are wonderful lessons for this pandemic COVID-19 strange world that we're living in. But it can be applied to any time because these are lessons for life. These are lessons how to walk with the Holy Spirit. And so the lesson for today is rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. This morning we're reading from Philippians 3. We're only going to read verse 1. And this morning Joel will be reading for us. But let's just ask God to open his word for us. Yes, Father, we thank you that you are God. Thank you that you've given us this word. And we always want to come and ask, open your word to us, Lord, that we do not misread it. That we see what you intend for us to see. And so, Lord... Open our minds that we understand, open our will so that we are obedient to what you call us to do. We pray all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. Philippians 3 verse 1 Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Rejoice. Have joy. Isn't that just absolutely fantastic. The picture of this world is, is that we are humans, we are sinful, we are broken, we are rebels, we reject this God of love and therefore we become enemies of God. And we are in this constant state of, of turmoil and we are children of Satan and we're heading for destruction. And into this world God steps as a savior. God steps in as a deliverer and say, I've come to save you, not because of you, but because of me. Not because you're good, but because I'm good. And he does everything to take us out of our brokenness, taking us out of our sin, and set us on a path for eternal life. That is amazing. And now imagine this happened to you. And you sit there thinking, but this is fantastic. This God is amazing. He is my God. He is my boss now. Whatever he asks me to do, I will do for the rest of my life. And then you wonder, I wonder what other type of things that he's going to ask me to do. I belong to him. Now. I owe my life to him. What are the type of commands that he is going to give me? And then you come across commands like this. God stepping in saying, have joy. Have joy. Rejoice. We must realize this is not a suggestion. It's not an optional for some people. You have the, the very blessed Christians, the one who's God's favor rests on, and they have joy. No, this is a command for everyone. And this is a command for all times, for every moment. Because we read further on in Philippians 4 verse 4, where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, 
rejoice. Now I know many of you might have grown up in church or church experience where this was not true. Your experience of church growing up was not, was not, had nothing to do with joy. Um, church was not a place for joy. Church was a place for seriousness. Church was a place for somberness. Church was a place for lack of emotions. I remember the church I grew up in, and I'm thankful because I got saved in that church. But the church had a rule that you're not allowed to clap hands in church. It's just it's not acceptable to clap hands in church. And then the, the, the denomination brought out a new songbook. And one of the songs was, All Your Nations Clap Your Hands. And that was very awkward, because now we're sitting in church singing, and it's saying, well, all nations clap your hands. And so someone said, well, I, they think we should do it like this, because at least that's a, a respectful way of clapping your hands. Do you know why this is true? Do you know why many churches have a culture like that? It's got nothing to do with the Bible. It's got to do with Stoicism, the Stoics. Long ago, the church became heavily under the influence of the Stoics. Now, Stoicism started long ago. In the 3rd century before Christ, there was a Greek philosopher called Zeno of Citium. Zeno of Citium. And he started this philosophical idea of Stoicism. We read there, it says, The path to eudaimonia, which is happiness or, or blessedness, is found in accepting the moment as it presents itself. By not allowing oneself to be controlled by the desire for pleasure or fear of pain. By using one's mind to understand the world and to do one's part in nature's plan. And by working together and treating others fairly and justly. So Stoic says, the world is serious business. Do not get distracted from the serious calling of just doing the right thing. Do not try to be happy. Make sure you don't get sad. Be serious. I mean, even the picture of Zeno, you can see this frown on his forehead. But this is wrong. This is very, very wrong. Because that's not biblical. That's not godly. That's worldly. Stoicism is about suppressing emotions. About neither desiring joy nor experiencing, experiencing sadness. Is that what you find in the Bible? God is a God of emotions and we are made in His image and we are made to live out our emotions in a godly way. We have a Jesus who calls us to rejoice, a command to seek and desire joy. So yes, joy is not an option. It is the normal Christian way. That doesn't mean we'll always feel on a high. That doesn't mean we won't have moments where we are down and in despair. We saw last week, Jesus had moments of despair and moments of trouble in his soul. What this means is that whenever we are in despair, there's always a road out of that into joy. God always gives us a path that when we are down, that we can walk out and get to joy. Isn't this just fantastically fantastic? It is so hopeful. Because it means that if I am down, if I am depressed, if I am down in the dumps, God says, I am calling you to get out of it. I'm calling you to my way, and my way is a way of joy. So that is exactly what we want to speak about today. How do I, how do I reach that joy? How do I get to that joy that God is commanding me to do? So where do we find that joy? Let's look again at verse 1 there. Um, and it says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Now, that's wonderfully clear that we are called for joy. But this joy is found in the Lord, not from the Lord. Now, what does that mean? We get many great gifts from God, great things, spouses, children, success, provision, possessions, experiences. But none of them were ever designed to be our primary sense of joy. None of them were the thing that God gave us and says, okay, from now on, this will be your source of joy. And this is why we often struggle with joy, because we are looking for joy in those things. We are looking for joy in the wrong place. 
people will let you down. Success will fade. Um, provisions will dry up. Um, experience, great experiences, might be replaced by very unpleasant experiences. If you look for your joy there, you will always be left feeling dissatisfied. But we are called to find our joy in Christ, in relationship with Him, in walking with Him, in spending time with Him, in obeying Him, in that closeness with God is where we find our joy. Now, the next, the verse also gives us three other things that helps us to see how do we get that joy in Christ. The first one we see there is in the word finally. Now, finally here doesn't mean in conclusion or to wrap it all up because he's not at the end of the letter. And there's another finally coming later on in chapter 4, verse 8. A more direct translation of this word finally would be and for the rest. So this is Paul saying, we've spoken now about how life must be lived. We've spoken about this life that is the good work that God starts in you that must be brought to completion. And it looks like this. Um, it looks like serving. It looks like being humble. It looks like giving. And once you've got that, once you've desired and, and worked at living like that, now we can move on and we can get to what comes after that. What comes as a response to that? And so here is a great tip for joy from Paul. Don't think you will get joy if you neglect or refuse all those preceding lessons. Don't think you can skip out on some of those or ignore some of those and still get joy. Joy comes after those things. And so let's look at those lessons. And of course we can't go into them in detail, but they're all on, on the internet. You can go look at the videos there. But as I read through them again, just do a quick mental check and say, how am I doing with this one? Maybe this one is the bottleneck for my joy. Maybe I'm not experiencing joy because I'm kicking against this one. And so the lessons are there. First one is we need each other. Don't isolate yourself from the church. We need each other. Secondly, pray. No joy without prayer. The third one is grow up. Stop learning like a spiritual child and grow up. The next one, don't fear death. But yet, aim for life. For the benefit of others, make sure you stay alive as much as possible. The fifth one says, live worthy of the gospel. The sixth one says, and this is often a great bottleneck for joy. Suffering is a gift. If you see suffering as a punishment or suffering as a sign that God is not good or that God does not love you, you will never get to joy. But once you start seeing suffering as a gift, it can lead you to joy. Seventh one says, Know where to find your strength. Have your personal quiet walk with God. The next one says, aim for unity through humility. The ninth one, practice humility. You will not have joy if you allow disunity between you and other believers in the church. The tenth one says, obey gladly to the glory of God. The eleventh one says, giving your life for others brings joy. He's already hinted there. A pathway to joy. If I live my life for myself, I will be miserable. But if I give it for others, I will have joy. Number 12 says, show genuine concern. And then the 13th one says, risk your life. And so here, Paul is saying, you want to get to joy? These are the stepping stones to joy. Make sure you walk this path to get to joy. So that's the first tip in helping us how to get to joy. Now the second tip is there in the word my brothers. And just a reminder that this could also be translated as my brothers and sisters because it's a Greek way of speaking. If you have a crowd in front of you which have men, male and female, in Greek you would only say males. Where we don't do it like that. We would say ladies and gentlemen. And so to translate it into English you're welcome to say brothers and sisters. But what is he saying by saying my brothers? He is saying, true, lasting, perfect joy is only found by those who are truly saved. 
true lasting joy is only found by those who are saved by God into the church, into the family of believers. It's for those who spend time alone with God because you're his child. It's those who spend time with God, with others, because they're your family. And they're also children of God. You see, um, this joy doesn't happen automatically just because you call yourself a Christian. It doesn't happen automatically just because you belong to a church. A lot of people think they're Christian. They, they go to church. They tick Christian on the census boxes. But they, there's something massively missing. And they think just because I belong means I have everything God has to offer. And that's not true. It's as untrue as just belonging to the gym makes you fit. Just having a gym card and knowing that I belong to a gym doesn't mean anything. Do I go to the gym? Do I involve myself with the things of the gym? And that's the same about us. Do I truly belong to God? Do I live my life in His presence? Do I do what He tells me to do? You know, research has shown that only about 20% of people, actually 18% of people, who belong to a gym actually goes. So 80% of them sitting there wondering, well, I joined the gym and nothing ever changed. And that's sadly true of many Christians as well. Well, I've said the little prayer and I do go to church if there's not rugby on the TV, and, but nothing has changed. Because you've never become a brother. You've never become a sister. You've never become a child of God. So that's the second tip. You can call yourself a Christian until you're blue in the face. Unless you actually go to the Lord, you will never experience the goodness of God. And that includes joy. So when we do counseling for people who are struggling with joy, people who are um, depressed or things like that, there are two very important questions to ask them very early on us. How is your relationship with God? Are you truly a believer? And if you are, do you live in His presence? And the second question we ask is, how is your relationship with the church? Are you in a church? Do you belong? Do you take part? Are you part of the family there? Do you, do you serve there? And so joy is for the brothers and sisters and the children of God. So can I ask you again today? Are you truly saved? The Bible says make sure of your salvation. Are you just a church card holder? Are you just someone who has the label Christian on you, but it's an outside label, it's not a label in your heart. It's never been a heart change. There's never been a surrender to God. Because that is what it means to become a child of God. Faith means to follow. Faith means to come before the God of the universe and say, I need you, you are God. You're the only one who can fix this relationship between me and you. And thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for letting him die for my sins. So please forgive my sins. I'm on my knees before you. Please accept me. Make me your child. Make me new. That's faith. And then to get up there and follow him for the rest of your life. So that's the, the second tip. The second tip about getting joy. Now the third tip we find there in the rest of the verse where it says, where it says to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So what is Paul saying to them here? He's saying, you know, this message about joy, and, and it actually includes everything he's saying. He says, I've told you this before. This is not the first time that I'm telling you this, and it's definitely not going to be the last time. Um, I'm telling you this again and again, and it's good that I'm telling you again and again, because this is very important for you. This message, if you grab hold of it, makes you safe. In other words, it safeguards you against life. And that's what he's trying to say. And this is why it's so important to hear things again. You know, I can preach this message and if I get to the end of this, some of you will say, you didn't tell me anything new. I knew all of this. And I know some of you know all of this. But I need to tell you again because we all leak holiness. We all leak truth. We all slowly wander away so that we constantly have to be pulled back with the same truths. That's why for the rest of our lives, one book is enough for us. For the rest of our lives, the Bible will always be the book we need, always be the book we go back to, because we need constant replenishing of the oil of our fire. We burn that oil away. We need to go back to God time and again. 
hearing the same things, to, 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 to be safe, to be safe guarded against his life, to be safe in his presence and be his child. So in conclusion, true, lasting, unchanging, perfect joy is never found in the world because the world is not true and the world is not lasting and the world is not unchanging. And so if you want to try to put your joy in something that does not stand still, you'll never find joy. It's trying, like trying to balance a glass of water on the head of a cat. You're just going to be frustrated because that cat is moving around all the time. But God is true. God is perfect. God never changes. God's love is forever. God's mercies are new every morning. And so there is a place you would want to find your joy. So I want to invite you again. Be honest with yourself. Are you trying to find your joy from God? Or are you finding your joy in God? Are you walking with Him? Are you walking in the light like He is in the light? Joy is a command for believers. And it is fantastic that it is a command. Because it's God saying, this is my way. This is my path of life. Come and join me. But we have to listen how we get on that road. We have to take all these things in and obey. Joy follows obedience. Let's pray together. Yes, Father, we, we thank you that you are a joyous God. A God who not only saves, but who gives us joy. And Lord, I specifically want to pray for those today who are struggling with joy. Who are struggling with um, getting out of the dumps, Lord. Out of the, the depression or the deep hole that they are in. Lord, that they will see you and realize true joy is only found in you, not in the things you give us, because those things come and go. Lord, I want to pray that they will go through this list that you've given us in Philippians and ask, am I really obedient to all of that? Am I least, at least agreed that this is how I want to live my life? Pin, Holy Spirit, pinpoint things where we are struggling, where we are failing there, and give us the strength to do it. And Lord, then I want to pray for for a clear understanding of whether we are truly saved, whether we are truly part of the family. And then, Lord, make us perseverance in coming in again and again, in hearing the same truths and again and again, to replenish the oil of the flame that's burning inside of us. Thank you that you are patient. Thank you that you are consistent. Thank you that you are joy. We pray this all in your wonderful name. Amen. Make my life a prayer to you I want to do what you want me to No empty words and no white lies No token prayers, no compromise